Hi everyone, I'm Marty Logan. Thank you for choosing to listen to Nepal Now on the Move from the literally millions of podcasts available. This is our third episode since we shifted the show's focus to migration to, from, and within Nepal. And I gotta say, I'm biting my nails, waiting for feedback from you listeners, especially longtime fans. Good, bad, or indifferent, I want to hear it. Your responses are the best way for me to see how I might improve the show. So please take a minute to leave a comment on Instagram, Facebook, or LinkedIn. Email me at nepalnowpod at gmail.com or leave a review on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. Today we're speaking with another returnee to Nepal, but one with a much different story than what we heard from Baker entrepreneur Ansal last week. We're calling her Sushma, which is not her real name, because she has received threats from people who were involved in sending her to work in Kuwait. Sushma has filed a report with police, but nothing has come of it as of March 31st. The good news is that she is back home with her children, who she was very worried about, and she's taking medication. Sushma left her village in Nepal's Karnali region last November, and within a month was in Dubai, waiting to be taken to a job in Kuwait. She arrived there after a month, but stayed only three months because she fell ill. But not before being threatened with harm if she didn't go back to work. She also saw another worker being hit by a house owner, had her phone taken away, and was told by employers in another house that she couldn't leave because we bought you. Back in Nepal, Sushma, who didn't attend school as a child and used to earn money in her village by manually breaking stones, is now settled with a huge debt after her family mortgaged land to pay the agent for her ticket home. But given what she experienced in her brief stay in Kuwait, that seems far better than other possible outcomes. This is the first episode where I worked with an interpreter, Pranika Koyu, who was in the studio with Sushma and I. She did an amazing job, but occasionally you might hear that I left out a voice when I shouldn't have. That and any other editing errors are mine. A couple other notes. You'll hear us talk about lakhs of money. One lakh is 100,000 Nepali rupees, which is about 750 US dollars. Also, Sushma says sometimes that the agent demanded 3 lakhs 50,000 rupees for her return. Other times she says 3 lakh 20,000. We settled on the last amount. Finally, near the end of our conversation, I asked Sushma about something I had heard earlier in the day about her police case. I deliberately deleted the name of the person who told me for the same security reasons. Just one more thing. I recently found out that there are two versions of the show on Apple Podcasts. I have no idea how that happened, but it means I need to delete one. The choice is easy. One has all the episodes and one has fewer, and one has quite a few uh, subscribers, I like to think. And one has only about 20. So that second one I'm going to delete. I'll do that tomorrow. If you listen to the show on Apple Podcasts, just be aware of that. And if you notice something has changed, particularly if you can't access the show anymore, then I would suggest you delete it from Apple Podcasts and then re-subscribe or re-follow, however it works on Apple. If you have any problems beyond that, let me know. Uh, NepalNowPod at gmail.com or on our social channels. Please listen now to Sushma's story. Sushma, welcome to Nepal Now podcast. Sushma ji, tapai lai Nepal Now podcast ma swagat cha. Dhanyawad sir. We're going to talk about your migration experience. Your re- you've recently come back, but first if you can tell me a little bit about where you grew up and your childhood, what that was like. I grew up in Nepal only. I have not even gone to India. I got married 
I have children, but then like I lost contact with my husband after two, three years. And that's why I had to go abroad. Okay. And I understand that you are from Rukum West. Is that right? Uh, I am like my maternal home is in Salen and I got married to Rukum. I mean, I got married in Rukum. Okay. Mm. And so your family is, uh, you still have your your own family in Salyan? My brothers, parents are there in, sisters, they are in Salyan, but I got married in Rukum. Okay. And just to go back a little bit, when you were younger, did you have a chance to go to school? My parents might have wanted to send us to school, but I didn't go. Was it uh, a matter of money? You didn't have money or there was just other things you had work to do? You were busy with other household things? My parents, like my father, might have had money also, but I don't know. And um, like I used to play with other children and I would go to jungle to collect fathers with them. So that's why I didn't go. It sounds like where you were growing up, it, it wasn't unusual for kids to not go to school. Um, well, like the children, they used to go to school. Elder brothers were there, elder sisters were there. But I don't know why I didn't go. And when you got married, how old were you? Seventeen years. Your parents, I guess your parents arranged this. Were you okay and happy to be married? Uh, it was not my parents who arranged the marriage. It was I myself who found him. And so you got married, you were 17. You then moved to your husband's house in Rukum. How, how many children have you had since then? How many do you have, I should say? Two sons and one daughter. So uh, you lost contact with your husband, but you stayed I in his house in Rukum. In Rukum, is that what? right? Yeah, that's right. And when did you start thinking about going to work outside of Nepal? So, you know, at home, I used to do all sorts of like this stone related work, like Gitti, the stone crossing and all that, because I had to take care of my three children. Um, the husband, I also tried to get him into contact and sometimes he would be in touch also, but then he would not send any money. And uh, around that time, uh, there was this one woman who had gone uh, abroad. So with her, I came to know about going out. And I went to Kuwait, and I really had a lot of difficult times there. So the woman who told her about this experience, was she in the same village or nearby, or how did she make, hear about this? So she is uh, my husband's mother's uh, sister's daughter. So they are maternal cousins, yeah. Okay. Did they go together or was that woman already there or had already been there and then came back? So this woman had been working in Kuwait for the last one year. I had uh, contact with her and then she's still there. I'm the only one who came back. Okay. And what did she tell uh, her about working in Kuwait, what, what was it like, uh, money, conditions, all of that? Uh, 
Yeah, she just told me that, you know, uh, you will be able to do it. It is just household course to be done. And then I said, okay, then get me in touch with the agent. She gave me the phone number. I contacted, I came here, made my passport, and I went. Did it happen that quickly? It sounds very fast. Like from the time she first talked to this woman about being in Kuwait to the time that she came to Kathmandu to make her passport, how, how much time was it? So I had contacted uh, with this niece of mine uh, for about like four or five times. And then I came to Kathmandu, made passport, doing all that. It took like one month. Well, it's very mm-hmm. fast. And I know that her friend in Kuwait made it sound like it, it was quite doable and, and a fairly good prospect. But were you at all worried about going? And what did the people around you in the village, like your in-laws and other people in the family and friends, what did they say to you about the possibility of going? Like, I did not tell my children because I thought they would cry. And I told my father uh, that I will be back after two years. And my father said, you will not go. So when you left uh, to come here and make your passport, uh, your children were with your father-in-law and mother-in-law in Rukum, or were they in Salian with your... They were in Rukum only, but at the house of her, uh, my cousin, the mother of my cousin. My auntie. It's in the agent we're talking about, mm-hmm. right? Who helped you get the job? Just to confirm that the agent is based here in Kathmandu, and so you came here. You paid the agent to basically take you to Kuwait. And how much did you have to pay? And how quickly did that happen? Like after you came to Kathmandu. The agent is here in Kathmandu only. Um, I did not have to pay any money to the agent. Uh, When I came from Rukum, that was the only expense of my own. Uh, The plane ticket to Kuwait was covered by the agent. Okay, and so the agent arranged the job for you. He arranged the position. He got you the job. And so there was no price to pay him for doing that work? Is it Lint. 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 No? Lint. no, he, uh, like, the agent did not take any money. I did not have to pay him anything. But when I wanted to come back, I had to pay... 3,20,000 Nepali rupees uh, while I was there in Kuwait only. I had to ha- have it deposited in his account. So that was after she told him she wanted to come back, then she had to pay that money, uh, and then he arranged the plane ticket back? Yeah, I don't know. They never told me anything. Okay. So at first, um, I got sick and I wanted to come back and I told them that, uh, please, like, you know, uh, get me back. And then they said, like, I have to pay 350000 Uh They also said, like, when you come back, we will see you. We will see you. And... Um, one lakh twenty thousand rupees. I already had it as my salary there, and then so two lakh got topped up from here. So three lakh twenty thousand only has been paid. So when exactly did you leave Kathmandu to go to Kuwait? So November, last November. This past November. Yes. Okay, quite recently, and so it was a direct plane flight from Kathmandu direct to Kuwait. So from Kathmandu, I was taken to Dubai 
There I stayed for one month and then taken to Kuwait. And when you were going, did you think that what you were doing was legal or did you think it, you were doing something under the table, something in the black market? Um, nothing was told to us. And then, uh, like, even the name of the manpower company was not told to us. They just said, like, the work will be fine. That is it. Okay. So just to get some of the details, try to get some of the details, the agent who you were dealing with is different than the manpower company? They're two different things? There were altogether six people involved, two here, two in Dubai, two in Kuwait. Uh, there used to be one room, which they used to refer as office. They had taken our mobile also, and at times they would give it to us just to be able to talk to our family. And when you say we, because you keep saying we mm. instead of I, how many people were you with and did you know who they were? Were they all men or women or were there some men? Were you all going to the same place? So there were altogether 21 or 22 of us who were taken to Dubai and there we had to wait to be able to go to Kuwait to work. And uh, of the 21, 22 also, like we would not be sent to one place to work, like we will be sent to different, different places where they would say it's our office. And I don't know like who all went where. Uh, as for me, I stayed for three months, I worked and I got sick. So I told them that I want to return, but they did not want me to return. They said that they would like if you give us three lakh fifty thousand Nepali rupees, then we will uh, get you returned. But I kept on telling them that my children at home will cry, will look for me, and I have to come back. So when you left here and you went, you were going to Kuwait. You stopped in Dubai. What did you do in Dubai during that month? Were you working or training or just waiting? Did you get worried that? You, you might not actually be going to Kuwait? What did they tell you? So first of all, like for one week, we were not going anywhere. But then uh, slowly, like one or two of them start, of the women, they started to get sent to Kuwait. Our mobiles were not with us. And... Um, they wouldn't actually tell us where we were going, uh, what kind of work it would be. It took, it took a month for me to go to Kuwait working. It was just like that. Nothing was told to us. Mm. And were they living and sleeping in the same room? Like it, was it one big room or did they have separate rooms? Were they sleeping on the floor? Were they comfortable? It sounds like possibly not if they're not getting enough food and water. It was like this, like there was one room for men and one room for women. When I saw that, I thought that I, we will not be provided with food and we will die just like that. But it was not like that. In reality, we were given, given meal two times. Two times a day. Two times a day. And then one day they said, okay, today you're going to Kuwait. How many of you went on that day? And men and women or just women? So it was five of us women who went to Kuwait from Dubai. There were no men. And so where, where were you taken in Kuwait? Where did you, where was the place that you ended up working? So in the beginning, on the day we reached Kuwait, around evening, an Arabi, they, he came to pick us up. 
and get us. And then I went there. And it had just been two or three days that I was working. Uh, the house, it already had one Filipino um, help. But I did not know that that Filipino help was having fights with the house owner's wife. And uh, on the third day, I kind of got to see that she had marks on her body. Uh, she was hit by the uh, serving spoons. And then I also saw like once it being thrown. And then I came and I said, like, what's happening? What's happening? And then I was pushed aside, not allowed to see um, what was happening inside, saying, like, you don't come here. Uh, there could have been a knife also. I'm not sure uh, where the Filipino went. So after that, you didn't see the Filipino working there anymore? Yeah, I did not see the, the Filipino. So in total, I worked there for six days. Um, and then I told the office that I don't want to work here, like get me out of here. And then they took me to, they took me back to the office and they sent me to another house. And did you want to leave the house because you also were abused by the family there? Or were you just worried about be working in that house? I felt that the, that I will also get killed. And also, I didn't feel that they were good people. And I just didn't want to work there. And how was the new house that you got sent to? So I was about to get the salary. Just like two or three days were left. But I got sick and then I was brought to the office. And so did you call the office and say, I'm sick, please come and take me away? Or did they see that you were not, that you were ill themselves and the house, the owners of the house asked you to be taken? I got sick. And then uh, so there's this person called Baba. Uh, so he asked whether I want to work or not. And then I said that I am sick. Either I have to be like uh, returned to Nepal or take me to the office. And then I was taken to the office. And then how long after being taken to the office, after getting sick, how long before you came home then back to Nepal? I was not sent back to Nepal immediately. I stayed in the office for two weeks. And then, uh, so these people, they started to say, either you return to the house and start working, or we will see. We will see in a, like, you know, threatening way. And then, um, then I told them that I am sick. And then, like, I am sick, I cannot work. Um, and I was also taken to doctor by the people at the house, like, where I was working. Like everything, nothing was shown in the examination. Uh, in the meantime, they, like my cousins, had started to contact this uh, agent, like started to look for me. Uh, and the agent had blocked my phone as well as theirs. And they told me that uh, if I pay 350,000 Nepali rupees, then I will be sent home. During that time, I came to know about the agent from Delhi, uh, with whom I stayed for two weeks, and then again I got sent to the sent to another house to work. So from the or original agent in Kuwait, where she stayed, where you stayed for two weeks after getting sick, then you moved to another agent for two more weeks, and that agent sent you to work at another house. Is that? Yeah, that's right. Okay, and were you still feeling sick all of this time? Did it change? So, um, in between, I did get sick, and my head was not working. Uh, my legs, they felt weak, and I was, it was like hard of breathing also, right? And my stomach also would hurt. And I actually told the um, 
told this new household where I was working what I was facing, and it had already been a month. But uh, they said like we have bought you and we cannot uh, give you back, um, and the agent out there were also asking for money, right? And they were saying that um, I have to give them money. Then I told them like we should collect money to be paid to them at any cost. We have to like even if it is selling my land, that's okay. And uh, but um, the this new household in the new household when they came to when I told them that how why I cannot war why why I cannot work and how sick I am, uh, they kind of like held me captive for six days. I was not given food, no nothing. I was closed in the room. My clothes were taken, my things were taken, and I really suffered a lot. Wow. Six days that you were kept locked up without being able to leave or, or call anyone? So I was locked up for six days in the room. And my mobile had also been taken and I was not given any food. And then how did you finally get out and leave that house? I got to contact, like I was contacting Kuwait's agent, agent in Kuwait only. And then I told them like, brother, listen, like I am so sick. I cannot work. I will pay and I will pay, but get me returned. And they said like they have, I have to pay 300,000 rupees, like three lakh rupees, uh, which I managed in a sense, like from the people here in Nepal, they had it deposited and that's how I returned. And then you came directly back to Nepal. In Kuwait, the office in Kuwait, I stayed there for five days and then I flew direct from Kuwait to Nepal. And during those five days, did people try to convince you to stay there? Did they treat you well? Did they treat you badly? So there were two of them there, and um, the one from Delhi, um, that person was not very harsh, but uh, the one from the one who is a Bengali, um, he used to be very harsh. He used to say like, "Go back to working." Or else, like uh, we can do anything to you, and then uh, and then you're not going home. He used to say that, and uh, the one from Delhi, um, he used to say that no, we should not be saying like that. She's honest. She would have worked had she not been sickly, but now she's sick, so she can go back. And then, at one point, the money was deposited in their bank account, so you they got you a ticket, and then you came back. Is that right? Yeah, so the money got deposited in their account and three days after, I got to fly back. And how long ago was that now? It's just been a week. So you've paid the money, the 350,000 mm. rupees. Are you... <coughs> trying to get that money back or some of that money back? Are you angry at the agent or what's happening? Yeah, so after coming back from there, I have tried to get the money back from the agent. Uh, my children are crying. They just want to know when I'm coming back to the village. Uh, money lenders are after me. They are saying like, oh, you have come back, you have earned and you are staying in Kathmandu. Why are you staying in Kathmandu? Pay us back like that. I am trying to get my money back, but it's not, uh, it's not going anywhere. And then how do you feel now? Do you feel better since you came back to Nepal? I'm 
I'm not well. I still feel sickly. Like my breathing, it's like it fluctuates, uh, and my legs also they're not as weak. Uh, they're not as strong, and then my head also like I see the same person also like in four like it's a hallucination sort of thing, uh, and I don't know how I'm talking with you guys also at the moment. I'm not well. Okay, so we'll try to make this quick. So the money that you had to give the agent, so one hundred and twenty thousand, I think, was from your own salary from the work that you did there, and then the rest, over two hundred thousand, was raised here by people here. Was that borrowed from money lenders? That two hundred thousand. Sao ro banda bani ani mero deor la mero keta keti agli boyo. So one lakh twenty thousand Nepali rupees was my salary, which actually had not been given to me, but the agents in Kuwait they um, made sure that I got that money from the house owner, like where I was working. Uh, the other two lakh uh, Nepali rupees, uh, how I arranged is like I had to my younger brother-in-law had to mortgage it uh, from people to get the. Um, to get the money, nobody was giving, so the land had to be mortgaged. And so, what do you plan to do now? When do you think you'll be able to go back to your village and see your kids? Do you need to go see about your health before you do that? Ani bocha bochi arla ani mere gar gani apno sasthe ko upchara aru garna. First, of course, like it will be meeting children, taking care of my health. Um, and then after I get well, then look out, look for the work so that I can pay back, cover my expenses. Otherwise, I'll not be able to live. Why do you think your trip, your time in Kuwait, ended the way it ended? Like, why do you think you had such a bad experience in Kuwait? Yeah, I don't know why that happened to me. I'm wondering if she, during this whole time, she talked to the friend that she was first in touch with, who mm-hmm. told her about this work. Like, did you talk to her? Did you get advice from her? Has she said anything about what happened to you? Actually, I had also asked her to help me, and when she came to know about my situation. She had contacted the agent also, but her number was also blocked, uh, got blocked by the agent. But um, she seems to have told the agent that uh, I am her family member, and if anything happens to me, then it will not be good for her as well. However, um, her house owner also uh, ran away uh, without giving her the money. And then the mobile also had been her mobile also had been taken by the house owner. So for a month or so she was contactless. So I know this just happened, and there's still a lot that you need to deal with and and think about and understand. But do you think you might try to go back again to work overseas? Maybe not Kuwait, but another place. Babu le jana di dena abuta babu or lastai door mania cha garma. Um, I don't think my children will allow me to go. They are very scared. Once you're back in the village and your health is okay and things are back to normal, the way they used to be, how will you make money? How how will you earn for your children? Um, I don't know, like, how will I be able to take care of that? Because it will take me at least one or two months to get well, and um, like farming also, it doesn't produce much. Uh, we don't have any other source of income. I don't know how I will be taking care of my expenses. If someone in your family or in your village, someone you know, asks you, "Should I go overseas to work to earn money?" What would you say to them? Uh, what will I say? Like, I returned because I was sick. But if anybody wants to go, I will not say, don't go. How can I say that? It's their own choice. 
but I will I will indeed tell them that there might be problems like language issues. Let them do what they want. Just one last question. Do you think you got sick because of the stress of being in this different place? Like, do you think it was a physical thing or like a mental stress thing or just a combination of not feeling good overall? I don't know why, I mean, it happened, but at least for the first two months, I was working quite well. Even if they were screaming, we were thinking of our family, we were thinking of our debts, and then we were working. But uh, by the third month, I was really not feeling well. Earlier today, I spoke to, and he said that you were going, or you had made a report to the police. So if you want to tell me something about this, um, I'm interested to know what that is about, but if you can't talk about it or don't want to talk about it, that's also okay. Like I filed a complaint, uh, hoping that you know it might bring me back some of my money. Against the agent? So I filed the complaint against the agent, hoping that it might bring me back some of my money. And do the police think it's possible? So yesterday when police was calling them in their number, they were answering the phone, but today they said it's switched off. The police phone is switched off? The agent's phone is switched off, yeah. yeah. So yesterday... Uh, police called them, the agent, and the phone call was being answered. But now the police are saying that it is switched off. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I know thank it's you. not easy to talk about these things, and we kept you a long time. You're not feeling well. So really, really thank you very much. I really appreciate it. But is there something you want to say before we finish? China, madam, I Mm, there's nothing really much to say. Whatever there was, I have already said it. Okay. Good luck. I hope your health gets better. And if you're fortunate, you'll get at least some of your money back from the agent. Ah, oh, sir. Thank you. Thank you once again to Sushma for sharing her story when she was still feeling ill and anxious to return to her village. Thank you also to Pauraki Nepal, which works with female returnee migrant workers for introducing us to Sushma. Let us know what you thought of this episode. We're at Nepal Now Pod on Instagram, LinkedIn, and Facebook. Next time, we will certainly be talking to Bharat Arikari, who returned from Oman, started a small business, then quickly gave it up. He was supposed to be featured in this episode but we thought it was important to get Sushma's experience online as soon as possible. I'll talk to you next time.